und damit hallo und willkommen zurück zu Pretty Old Pixel. Mein Name ist Selma und nach einigen mit hin und her habe ich die CD-Version von 1942 The Pacific Air War, manchmal nur Pacific Air War, wie ihr auch in dem Fenster sehen könnt, könnt Gold-Version installiert bekommen und die Multimedia-Komponente benutzt QuickTime irgendwie zum Teil und Video für Windows 1.1. Ich bin mir nicht sicher, ob das funktioniert. Ich weiß auch ehrlich gesagt nicht, was hier funktioniert. Wenn es nicht funktioniert, werdet ihr das ja eh nicht sehen. Also ich sehe das jetzt auch zum ersten Mal. Ich probiere das jetzt zusammen mit euch aus. Ihr seht hier im Hintergrund habe ich ähm, Windows 3.11 in der DOS-Box am Laufen. In der DOSBox X, um genau zu sagen. Damit lief es am besten. Und ich probiere das jetzt einfach so ein bisschen aus. Ich habe mir im Handbuch und so weiter nichts weiter durchgelesen. Ähm, ja, ich bin einfach nur mal gespannt, was das jetzt hier genau ist. Okay, hier drauf klicken ist äh, schon mal schlecht. Dann geht die Musik aus. <lacht> hier vermute ich, komme ich zum Spiel. Das scheint mir aber auch die, die DOS-Version zu sein, die ich dann auch in dieser DOSBox installiert habe. Und mit der DOS-Version kann ich, also mit der normalen DOSBox kann ich dann darauf zugreifen. Ist auch egal. Ich hatte jedenfalls Probleme damit, weil der Installer unter DOS einfach abstürzt. Was das hier ist, weiß ich auch nicht. Das ist Quid. Gucken wir mal in die Flight School. <lacht> This is where your mission begins. If you don't follow standard takeoff procedures, it is also where your mission will end. Launching yourself off a carrier deck inside several tons of metal requires you to have a great deal of faith in your plane and in your flying ability. Generally speaking, taking off is as simple as oh, revving up the engine and releasing the brakes. First, set the throttle to at least 80% power. If you're carrying a heavy bomb load, you may need to set the throttle at 100%. Next, release the brakes. Your plane will begin to move forward. When you have reached a speed of at least 80 to 90 knots, pull gently back on the stick. As soon as you're off the deck, raise your landing gear. Raising your gear reduces the drag on the plane and lets your plane accelerate at a higher rate. During the first few minutes of flight, your main concern should be getting some altitude between you and the ocean. Once you have gained some altitude, begin to turn into formation. During your initial climb, keep your maneuvers simple. Drastic movements in the time right after takeoff are likely to cause your plane to stall, bringing your mission to a quick and soggy end. Ich muss sagen, ich bin relativ beeindruckt davon, dass Okay, es ist schwarz-weiß, die Auflösung ist nicht groß. Ich habe das, äh, ihr habt ja eben gesehen, wie groß das Fenster ist. Ich habe das jetzt für euch ein bisschen rangezoomt. In Wirklichkeit ist es viel kleiner. Aber trotzdem, finde ich, hat sich jemand schon irgendwie Mühe damit gegeben. Die Hintergründe sind doch nicht einfach gerendert. Hier die Karte und so, das ist schön gepixelt mit diesem, ähm, wie nennt man das, Pinwand, Corkboard. Nächste. Landing is one of the most difficult parts of any mission. Add to that a runway that moves and rolls, and it becomes a rookie pilot's worst nightmare. However, with practice comes confidence. Once you are lined up with the end of the carrier, slow to just above stall speed. Make any adjustments gradually. A drastic maneuver will most likely cause you to stall. Next, lower your gear, flaps, and arrestor hook. The plane will begin to slow down. So be prepared. Try to land with a nose-up pitch just past the stern of the carrier. As soon as you touch the deck, cut your throttle and engage your wheel brakes. If you feel that you can't make the landing safely, increase your throttle, retract your gear and flaps, and circle around again. Never force a bad landing. Auch ein sehr guter Tipp. Take one high-speed plane, add several others flying close to it, and you have the potential for disaster. Formation flying was developed to lessen the risk associated with flying in close quarters. Maintaining formation allows every pilot in the group to know where every other plane should be. The first type of formation is the echelon. The planes fly behind and to one side of each other, maintaining a diagonal line. This formation is not recommended for more than five planes. The second type of formation is the V. The front two planes fly behind and to the side of the lead aircraft. 
Any other planes extend the legs in a diagonal fashion. This formation is recommended for bomber groups. Planes may also fly in combination formations. For example, a bomber group will typically fly in a V formation, while its escorts fly in echelon formations. The escorts should be positioned 1,000 feet above and away from the bombers in the direction of the threat. This maximizes the offensive power of the fighters and the defensive capabilities of the bomber. Okay, immerhin so zwei Formationen erklärt, scheinbar die wichtigsten. Ich habe noch keine Simulation. Überlege kurz. Ich glaube, nein, ich habe noch keine Simulation gespielt, in der, wir, in der man wirklich einen Unterschied gemerkt hat, in welcher Formation man fliegt. Dass es irgendwie einen taktischen Unterschied gemacht hat. Konnte ich jetzt noch nie, kann ich jetzt nicht sagen. Ach, das hatten wir doch schon. Äh, kann Which ich hier of the ah. controls are you interested in learning more about? Oh, jetzt kann man hier sogar sich noch mal aussuchen. Das ist ja These are the ailerons, which allow the plane to roll right and left. Moving the stick to the left causes the right aileron to tilt down and the left to tilt up. This rolls the plane to the left. Moving the stick to the right causes the left aileron to tilt down, while the right aileron tilts up, causing the plane to bank to the right. Hmm. These are the flaps. They are extensions of the wing which may be extended or retracted at the pilot's option. When extended, the flaps tilt downward, increasing the plane's lift but decreasing its speed. Extending the flaps allows the plane to fly at a reduced speed without stalling. In the game, the flaps are extended and retracted using the right and left bracket keys. Ich habe sowas, also Jahre später, also das ist 94, das ist die erste Multimedia-Anwendung für Windows, die ich gemacht habe. Ich glaube, das war irgendwie so 97 mit Macromedia Toolbox hieß das, glaube ich. Ich glaube, das war der Vorgänger von Director. Und da konnte man halt auch solche Sachen mitmachen. Von daher muss ich sagen, Hut ab. This is the rudder, which controls your direction of flight to the right and left. Turning the rudder to the right moves the plane's nose to the right. Turning the rudder to the left moves the plane's nose to the left. In an actual plane, the rudder is controlled by two pedals on the floor of the cockpit. In this game, the rudder can be controlled by the less than, greater than, and question mark keys, or with optional rudder pedal controls. These are the elevators, which are controlled with a flight stick. By moving the stick forwards or backwards, the tilt of the elevators is changed, causing the plane to pitch up and down. Ich bin begeistert. Which instrument would you like to learn about? Oh, das ist ja auch toll. Perhaps the most important instrument is your compass. When you leave the carrier, you will only have this and your map to guide you to the target and then back home again. When the compass indicates you are flying north, you are on course 000. When it points east, you are on course 90. South is course 180. And west is 270. Ich muss auch sagen, diese Stimme hat so diese typischen zweite, zweite Weltkrieg, so 40er, 50er Jahre ähm, äh, Farbe, Note, wie auch immer man das sagen will. Also diese Lehrfilme, wenn man den mal irgendwie, kann man ja bei Google will hier sehen, das ist schon ziemlich nett gemacht. The gauge labeled MP monitors your manifold pressure. Manifold pressure is a measure of the air pressure inside the engine. The higher the pressure, the more power you have available. If pressure begins to drop suddenly or has reached zero, the engine has probably been damaged and you should consider getting home or bailing out. So was gab's bei Aces of the Pacific zum Beispiel nicht und bei Pacific Strike auch nicht. The fuel gauge measures the amount of fuel left in the plane's tanks. There are actually two needles, a white one which measures the main tanks and a dimmer one which shows the fuel in any external tanks you are carrying. When the external tanks run dry, you should consider jettisoning them to lighten your load and improve your plane's performance. The altimeter is used to measure the aircraft's altitude relative to sea level. It is not a measure of the distance between the ground and your plane. 
If you fly over a mountain that is 5,000 feet high and your altimeter reads 6,000, there is only 1,000 feet between you and the mountain. The short needle indicates thousands of feet, while the long needle indicates hundreds. Das war, glaube ich, bei Aces of the Pacific und Aces of the Europe auch so, aber da der Boden in 99% der Fälle auch gleichzeitig Sea Level war, also war das kein Problem. The artificial horizon displays your aircraft's pitch and roll. Pitch is the vertical orientation of your aircraft, while roll is the horizontal orientation. In level flight, the ball is lined up with the horizon line. When you bank, the ball tilts in the direction you are turning. If you climb or dive, the ball goes above or beneath the horizon line. This instrument is particularly useful when you cannot see the horizon due to darkness or weather conditions. Das ist auch was, was ich lange unterschätzt habe, aber jetzt durch das viele Lesen von Memoiren ist mir das erst wirklich bewusst geworden, dass viele Piloten gerade am Anfang den Fehler gemacht haben, sich auf ihr, ihren Instinkt und ihr inneres Ohr und so weiter zu verlassen, um zu sagen, wenn man durch Wolken fliegt und so, wo ist oben und wo ist unten, wo ist, welche Geschwindigkeit habe ich, wo muss ich hinfliegen, dass viele, viele, viele Unfälle dadurch passiert sind, dass man sich darauf verlassen hat und eben nicht auf die Instrumente verlassen hat. Im Zweifel sind immer die Instrumente richtig. The engine temperature gauge indicates the operating temperature of your plane's engine. When flying normally, the needle rests at the middle of the gauge. Running your engine at high RPMs, carrying a heavy load or flying without oil will cause your engine to overheat. When this happens, it is likely that your engine will be damaged and cease functioning. Oh, das finde ich jetzt ein bisschen schade. Also zwei Sachen. Ich glaube hier die die ähm, Maschinen oder die Öltemperatur und die Manifold Temper der Manifold Pressure sind bei Aces in einem Temperaturinstrument vereint. Was was okay ist, weil Aces ja auch nicht diese Ihr seht, dass hier diese halben Cockpit und ganzen Cockpit-Ansichten hat. Zum anderen muss ich sagen, wenn man hier drauf klickt, seht ihr, dass hier so, eine, dass so ein Foto ist mit so Pinnen dran. Hier aber nicht. Das ist irgendwie schade, da haben sie es vergessen. Mhm. As the name indicates, it measures the pressure of the oil pumping through your engine. If the needle begins dropping, you can be pretty sure you've sustained damage. If at all possible, head for the nearest landing strip. Otherwise, the engine will eventually lose all of its oil and seize, causing you to drop like a rock. This is the tachometer. It measures the rotations per minute of the engine. It can be used as a relative measure of the throttle setting when on the carrier deck or in level flight. During a dive or a climb, the engine RPM varies drastically, so the tachometer readings are no longer an accurate measure of the throttle setting. Yeah. This is the airspeed indicator. It measures your speed relative to the air around the plane in knots. Keep in mind that your airspeed must stay above a certain point to avoid a stall. Stall speed varies according to the type of plane you are flying and the weapon and fuel load carried. Okay, ich glaube, das war's hier. Die restlichen, ich weiß gar nicht, Brakes, Flaps steht hier noch dran. Das war vermutlich Gear. Aber da gibt's nichts mehr zu. Okay, ziemlich cool. Hat mir gefallen. Was haben wir noch? Ah, okay. There are four basic advantages that you should try to achieve before you even pull the trigger. The first is awareness. If you know where the enemy is and he hasn't seen you, you have a distinct advantage over him. There are many ways to gain an awareness advantage. The most common is to fly with the sun at your back. The second advantage is altitude. When one plane is higher than the other, it has the altitude advantage. The higher plane often controls when the fight begins. It also has more potential energy available for maneuvering. Speed is the third consideration. Like the pilot with an altitude advantage, the faster moving plane has the greater potential for maneuvers. 
However, the slower plane can usually make quicker maneuvers, possibly luring the faster plane into overshooting. The final advantage is deflection. When maneuvering in for a shot, you must consider your course relative to the course of your target. Firing from an angle puts you at a disadvantage because of the uncertainty of leading the target. However, attacking a bomber from the rear will mean you must deal with his tail gun. So remember to consider your target when calculating the best deflection. Mm -hmm. Oh, das ist ja cool. Dass man sich hier die einzelnen Manöver aussuchen kann. The first maneuver is the aileron roll. It isn't particularly useful during combat, but it forms the basis for many of the more complex moves. The procedure is simple. Push the control stick all the way to either side. When the plane returns to an upright attitude, center the stick. The next maneuver is the barrel roll. It's just like an aileron roll with one modification. Push the stick all the way to either the left or right, and at the same time, pull back slightly on the stick. When the plane returns to an upright attitude, center the stick. This maneuver is a little more useful because instead of spinning in place, the plane moves in a corkscrew pattern. In combat, the barrel roll can be used to lure an inexperienced opponent into overshooting because it makes your plane lose some airspeed. Genau. Und dann, wenn man hier dann für die Manövrierfähigkeit, also ich finde Fliegen ist immer, ist eigentlich nur Energiemanagement und die Energie, die man benutzt, um nach vorne zu fliegen. Teile davon muss ich benutzen, um den Kurs zu wechseln, beziehungsweise meine Position zu verändern. Und dafür verbrauche ich Energie. Und wenn der andere nur geradeaus fliegt, fliegt er an einem vorbei. Ich wage immer noch zu bezweifeln, dass diese Manöver in, in diesem Spiel zumindest und in Vorgängerspielen wirklich was gebracht haben. The loop over is another maneuver that is not really useful in combat but is the foundation of other maneuvers, such as the Immelmann. When you begin, make sure you have plenty of airspeed. Then pull back hard on the stick. You will quickly gain altitude and lose speed. If you aren't moving fast enough, you may stall. So make sure the throttle is wide open. Once you reach the top of the loop, cut back some on the throttle and continue holding the stick back. You will quickly begin turning altitude into airspeed. When you reach the bottom, center the stick. You should be close to your original altitude and airspeed. The loop over leaves you vulnerable during the first half of the loop. But if you're lucky, you may end up on the tail of anyone who is following you. Das ist ja sehr, sehr optimistisch. Also das funktioniert in, einer optimalen, äh, in einem optimalen Flug, sage ich mal natürlich. Aber wenn sowieso schon irgendwie jemand hinter mir ist, ich sowieso ein bisschen langsamer bin, ich Energie verloren habe, dann wird diese Schleife natürlich riesig groß. So, dann schaffe ich es gerade und dann geht es erstmal nach unten, bis ich wieder genug Energie geholt habe, um dann so zu fliegen. Also, ja. Ihr kennt es. Another simple move is the wing over. Not often used in air to air combat. The wing over is normally used at the end of a strafing run if you want to make another pass at the target. Begin by pulling back on the stick. During this phase, you want to both gain altitude and lose speed, so don't adjust the throttle. The wing over relies heavily on the rudder, so you want to be going slowly. When you reach a good altitude for making your next run, press hard on the rudder in one direction and leave the stick centered. The plane should begin turning quickly. When you've completed the turn, center the rudder and push forward on the stick to begin your run. Also ja, das ist auch ein Manöver, was wirklich praktisch wäre und was man in Spielen auch einsetzen könnte. Problem ist also, ich fliege dann an, ziehe nach oben, so auf 75 Grad und dann benutze ich das Ruder, um mein Heck rumzuschieben und quasi wieder auf dem ungefähr gleichen Weg zurückzufliegen, auf dem ich gekommen bin. Und in einem Strafing Run, aus dem ich rauskomme, hier habe ich wahrscheinlich irgendwo in diesem Winkel gestrafed, ist das echt praktisch. Problem ist, ich muss dafür dann halt alle anderen Tasten loslassen, um auf der Tastatur dann halt meistens Punkt und Komma zu benutzen. Und das mache ich halt irgendwie nie, weil ich mit der linken Hand meistens irgendwelche anderen Sachen in dem Moment machen muss, in einer anderen 
in eine andere Ansicht wechseln muss oder was auch immer. Also leider ohne wirkliche Ruderpedale komme ich irgendwie schlecht dazu, das Ruder zu benutzen. Ja, spätere Simulationen hatten das ja dann sozusagen auf der Y-Achse, sodass ich den Griff des Joysticks nicht nur nach links, nach rechts, nach vorne und hinten, sondern auch sozusagen stehend drehen konnte nach rechts und links und ich darüber dann das Ruder hatte. Das war auf jeden Fall besser, hatte aber auch den Nachteil, dass wenn man wirklich fest im, im, am Steuern war, dass man dann so ein bisschen immer das Ruder bewegt hat, wenn man nach hinten oder so gegangen ist, weil man, weil man sich halt leicht verkrampft hatte sozusagen da. Aber ja, das ist auf jeden Fall ein relativ äh, praktisches Manöver. A similar move to the loop over is the loop under. You don't need to worry about your initial speed. However, if you're lower than 5,000 feet, don't bother, or you'll end up at the bottom of the ocean. Start by doing a half aileron roll. Once you are inverted, pull back hard on the stick. You'll begin gaining speed quickly, but don't do anything to slow the plane down, or you won't have enough speed to finish the maneuver. At the bottom of the loop, you'll stop accelerating and start gaining altitude. If you don't think you have enough speed to complete the loop without stalling, increase the throttle. When you reach the end of the loop, you should be at the same speed and altitude that you started. To finish the maneuver, do another half aileron loop so that you aren't inverted. The loop under can be very valuable during combat since the first half of the maneuver allows you to gain speed quickly. In some cases, a loop under allows you to get behind an enemy who has been following you closely. It is also used as the initial move of a split S. Richtig, Split, da kommen wir gleich noch drauf auf das Split S. Aber es ist natürlich auch wieder die, er hat es ja auch gesagt, unter 5000 Fuß braucht man es gar nicht versuchen, weil dann fliegt man halt in den Boden rein. Das heißt, man verliert viel Höhe, falls man das Manöver irgendwie mittendrin abbrechen muss. Das ist schon recht risikoreich. The next move is called the Immelmann. The Immelmann is a lot like the loop over, so you'll want to have plenty of airspeed. Begin by pulling back on the stick and performing a half loop. When you are flying inverted in the opposite direction, perform an aileron roll to complete the maneuver. This maneuver causes you to lose airspeed, but allows you to quickly change direction and gain altitude. This move is very useful if your enemy is higher than you are and on a different course. It should not be used when the enemy is directly behind you, since you are extremely vulnerable to attack during the initial climb. Ja, das ist wahr. Auch sollte man das nicht machen, wenn man irgendwie weiß, dass ein zweiter Feind über einem ist oder so, weil hier, man wird ja langsamer und dann ist man natürlich auch einfacher zu treffen. Also das sieht hier vielleicht ein bisschen komplizierter aus. Das bedeutet einfach nur, dass ich hier reinkomme, dann nach oben ziehe und dann rolle, in welche Richtung ich weg will. Also das kann ich ja, hier sind es halt 90 Grad Schritte, aber das kann ich ja variabel machen. Und dann ziehe ich halt in die Richtung so weit rum und lege mich dann wieder auf den Rücken und dann wieder auf den Bauch und dann kann ich in die Richtung entkommen. The split S is basically an Immelmann that goes down instead of up. Your primary concern at the beginning of this maneuver is that you have sufficient altitude to complete the maneuver. Begin by inverting the plane with a half roll. Then pull back on the stick and continue to pull back until your plane is flying level in the opposite direction. This maneuver is useful when you have an enemy directly behind you and you need to get out of his line of fire. At the end of the maneuver you will have lost altitude but gained considerable airspeed and reversed your direction. If you're outmatched you'll be able to use your increased airspeed to escape. The skid is a maneuver useful to you if you are flying behind an enemy but you are not at the correct angle to fire. The enemy is flying straight knowing that if you bank to get the right angle you'll only have a moment's worth of firing time at best. Skidding allows you to swing the nose of the plane without changing your course. All you need to do is push the rudder in the direction of the target. The plane will yaw in the direction of the rudder and you'll be able to take your shot. Das ist auch ein Manöver, was wir oft schon gemacht haben. Und eigentlich, wenn ich ehrlich bin, das einzige Manöver, wozu ich wirklich die Ruderkontrollen benutze. The slip is a maneuver which is useful in situations where the enemy is on your tail and you need to do a quick dodge to get out of his line of fire. First, step on the rudder in one direction. Then, with the rudder still down, bank in the opposite direction. If you do it right, the plane will slide in the direction of the bank while still maintaining level flight. 
When the enemy begins to adjust, simply slip in the opposite direction. Several slips in a row can be useful in eluding the enemy's fire. This move can also be used to slide in behind an enemy who is flying a parallel course with you. Habe ich auch oft schon probiert bei Aces of the Pacific, aber die KI hat, also entweder trifft sie einen oder sie trifft einen nicht. Das steht von vornherein fest und wenn sie einen trifft, dann kann man gefühlt, egal welches Manöver machen, äh, sie trifft einen dann trotzdem. The final maneuver is a classic dogfighting technique known as the scissors. If your plane is traveling in the same direction as the enemy, but you are too far away to slip or skid into an attack position, you must bank into position. Your enemy may read your move and bank in the opposite direction. Both planes then continue making a series of sharp turns as each tries to achieve an attack position. This pattern continues until one plane breaks away or is shot down. Performing this series of hard turns in opposite directions reduces the accuracy of the enemy's shot. If he survives, the defensive plane may be able to break out of the scissors and escape. Das ist ja das, was ich immer den Donut oder den invertierten Donut nenne. Äh, ja. Macht man auch oft, ist auch ein, ein sehr valides Manöver. Strafing can be a pilot's nightmare because it puts him in two positions he doesn't like to be in. First, he's low. Second, he's slow. The risk of stalling is very high and at a low altitude there will be no chance to recover. By following a few guidelines you can be sure the target and not your plane will be the one going to the bottom. First line yourself up with the target. Try to pick a reference point and stay centered on it. Next get to an altitude where you're low enough to hit the target with your bullets but not low enough that you risk crashing into the ground. Adjust your speed so that you'll be able to make last second adjustments to your aiming. Use the rudder and don't bank. When you get close enough, dip your nose and fire. Once you stop firing, pull up. One mistake many rookie pilots make is to become so fixed on the target that they end up plowing their plane right into the ground. If you hit the target, great, get out of there. If you miss or there are other targets, perform a wing over and make another run. Man, oh, gut was getroffen. Okay. Gucken wir uns das für die Bomber an. Whether you're flying a dive bomber or a torpedo bomber, you have two primary concerns when you're setting up for a bombing run. The first is staying in formation. The second is anti-aircraft fire or flak. If you're thinking about anything else, stop. Or chances are you won't have the opportunity to release your payload. Why stay in formation? That's a question that many rookies ask. The reasoning is simple. There's safety in numbers. If a flight of three enemy fighters attack and you are out of formation, you have a much lower chance of surviving. If you've got two of your fellow bombers, then the odds become a bit more even. Your second concern is anti-aircraft fire from the target, or flak. Unfortunately, to get an accurate shot at your target, you must fly almost straight towards it at a constant speed. When the AAA gunners on the ship see your flight headed right for them, they've got a pretty good idea that they're the target. So they'll do everything in their power to knock you out of the sky before you have a chance to hurt them. All you can do is make minor course and altitude changes, known as jinking, to deny them an easy target and hope the gunners are having a bad day. Of course, the more you jink, the harder it is for you to stay on target. Yep. To become a dive bomber, you have to be a special breed of pilot. Dive bombers are one part calculating genius and one part maniac. Genius because you release your bombs only when altitude, attitude, airspeed, angle of attack, and lead time have all come into sync. Maniac, because you throw yourself into a screaming dive at the target while adjusting your flight path, dodging flak, and looking out for enemy fighters. When you're planning your bombing run, you should take into consideration the correct altitude, the course and speed of the target, and the optimum angle of attack. You will probably want to attack a ship target from the rear. This minimizes your exposure to anti-aircraft fire and presents a bigger target, allowing you to attack along the length of the ship. 
Begin your dive once you are on course and about to fly over the target. You may want to extend your dive brakes to slow your descent. When you've started your dive, begin looking through the bomb sight. Your first concern is the dive angle indicator. If it's nowhere near the center, you'll want to adjust the dive accordingly. Second, line your target up in the sight's crosshairs. Don't forget to lead the target. Finally, watch the altitude indicator. As it approaches the center, you'll be nearing the optimum release height. Once all three are within acceptable parameters, release the bombs. As soon as you let them go, retract the dive brakes and pull out of the dive. Don't worry about turning around to observe. Your job is done, so head for home. Das werden wir üben müssen. Das natürlich auch. When approaching a target in a torpedo bomber, you should always approach your target from the side. If you try to attack a ship head on or from behind, you'll be wasting a valuable piece of ordnance. Depending on the type of airplane you're in, you'll want to be flying just above stall speed, usually at about 110 knots. Your altitude should be as close to the ocean as you dare, anywhere from 200 to 300 feet. <coughs> While approaching the target, you can jink to avoid enemy fire, but be careful. At that altitude, you could easily jink yourself right into the ocean. For maximum effectiveness, do not release your torpedo until you are at a range of 2,200 yards or less. If you aren't level, don't drop the torpedo. Any torpedo released from a plane that isn't level will probably end up a rogue and won't have a chance to hit anything. Don't forget to lead the target. It can take several minutes for the torpedo to travel to the target, depending on how far away you released it. Once you've let go of the torpedo, head for home. The fighters will stick around to check out the damage. Okay. Ooh. Also das klingt so, als wäre es ein bisschen mehr und wir haben ja auch auf der nächsten Seite noch ein bisschen was zu schauen. Ich würde sagen, das reicht erstmal für diese Folge. Ich hoffe, es hat euch gefallen. Ich bin relativ positiv überrascht, relativ positiv. Ich bin positiv überrascht davon. Das war ich ja zum Teil von den Aces of the Deep Multimedia Inhalten auch. Die waren auch sehr, gerade die Interviews mit den Assen waren ziemlich cool. Die, die ganze, das, dass das ganze Handbuch dann später da drin war, fand ich ja nicht so gut. Aber hier, das sind ja wirklich Visualisierungen, Veranschauungen, die nochmal die Inhalte des Handbuchs so ein bisschen kompakter darstellen. Das finde ich eigentlich ziemlich gut gemacht und ist auch wirklich ein nettes, ja, eine nette Dreingabe, ein, 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 ein nettes Dessert zu diesem Spiel. Ich freue mich sehr, dass wir es das ausprobiert haben. Ich hoffe, es hat euch auch gefallen. Bleibt vernünftig, bleibt uns gewogen. Bis zum nächsten Mal. Macht's gut, tschüss.